All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from sunny San Diego. And Jeffrey is an internationally recognized thought leader and award-winning author on the new, on new leadership and organizational design mindsets, models, and methods that are redefining modern business. And uh, you published a book, Developing the Conscious Leadership Developing the Conscious Leadership Mindset for the 21st Century, which has already won um, four national and international awards and is an Amazon bestseller. Uh, and today what we're going to talk about is this concept of, con of conscious leadership and its role in the 21st century. So we might as well dive straight in, Jeffrey, and uh, baseline this for us. Number one, like define kind of conscious leadership for us. And then also, what was the genesis of the book and what prompted you to, to write the book? Well, you know, conscious leadership is one of those terms that is yet to be fully adopted and clearly defined. So it's a little bit of the Wild West. Everybody's anybody who's practicing is coming at it from a uh, from a variety of angles. But my my particular angle is that uh, through the research that I've done, you know, I've built a couple of companies on my own in the last 17 years. I've been uh, a consultant helping other small to medium sized business entrepreneurs build theirs. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and about 15 years ago, I, I was a partner in a think tank for a couple of years where I really looked at what are the changes, what are the societal changes and the changes in business that are occurring that are impacting traditional leadership models, which there are quite a few. We have uh, probably the four or five most independent minded generations in the history of humanity in the workforce, and none of them want to be told what to do and all of them want to be empowered. <laughs> And that really goes against traditional command and control industrial age models. So the challenge for the leader is to uh, shift their level of consciousness with regards to how they view and engage their organization and the people in it. So uh, basically, it's becoming more people centric. It's becoming a leader that focuses on communication, collaboration, and facilitation, as opposed to top-down command and control uh, leadership styles. And uh, one thing it is not, is it's not about woo-woo. You, you know, <laughs> I, I, tell, I tell my clients right off the bat, look, this isn't about hugging people and creating all kinds of safe spaces. This is about challenging yourself as a leader to come from your highest level of consciousness, what I call your, your elder consciousness, not your egotistical consciousness when you're dealing with people. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, have very clear and respectful consequences for actions or inactions that are done that are counterproductive. Right. So it's really a blend. And it's also about being conscious about each step that you make as a leader realizing the impact it has on individuals and the organization. So it's mm -hmm. just really being much more uh, thoughtful and responsive to how you engage people and how you lead them. Yeah, and, and I'm really glad you made that clarification too about the, the as you said, the woo-woo bit, because mm -hmm. a lot of times when, when people hear things like this, they think, oh, as you said, it's about making people happy and not about in and results and like focus on results goes out the window and all of that. But it's, it's actually what you're saying. It's, it's, it's quite the opposite. It still has consequences. It's just approaching it in a, in a different fashion. It really is. And, you know, uh, Stephen Covey made a, uh, had a really good quote around uh, what it takes to be understood. And he says, first seek to understand and then to be understood. And I use a similar phrase to that when it comes to employee engagement, and that is first seek to engage the employee and then to be engaged. And I think mm -hmm. as leaders, we really have to take the lead on building the relationships, getting to know the people that are around you. And uh, and again, you know, it's not about getting rid of hierarchies and and uh, what have you, but it's about flattening, engaging the people mm -hmm. as a tribal network as opposed to silos and departments, which is really what every organization is. It's a tribe of tribes. Mm -hmm. So tell me, um, just to explain that, uh, that uh, what you just said a moment about uh, elder consciousness. What, what does that mean? Yeah, uh, I like shortcuts. And, uh, you know, things that allow me to carry a distinction in my head that helps keep me on the straight and narrow. 
you know, I was not born a conscious leader at all. Uh, you know, I built a couple of companies and, uh, and, you know, they were construction and engineering companies. So it was kind of a little bit of the wild west. And uh, what, uh, um, <laughs> can you repeat the question? I just, Sorry, it was an elder consciousness. Elder consciousness. Thank you. Yeah. So I kind of came from a command and control egoistic background. And about 20 years ago, I started expanding my, my spirituality. Uh, studied a lot of Taoism, Zen Buddhism, et cetera, and a lot of the main religions. And uh, what I realized was that uh, within, I was not my actions and I was not my thoughts. I was responsible for them. And I certainly wasn't my ego, but that there is this higher, this, this higher level of consciousness that exists in all of us that is sitting there ready to be tapped into. It's wise. And as I thought about it, the more I learned about it over the years, the, the best way I could describe it is it's like a tribal elder. And it's that part of me that is uh, respectful of people, that's wise, that's patient, that looks to promote the benefit of the group uh, and not just myself. And once I started tying into that, I then was able to realize how my ego felt versus how my elder felt. And when you, you know, the best way I can describe the inner mm. elder, is it's that part of me that whispers in my ear, don't send. When I'm about to hit that email, that's going to flame someone. Right. So, you know, we all have it, but it's just a matter of becoming familiar with it. And then once you do, uh, the more you uh, expose yourself to it and learn about it, the more you also learn about your ego and how the two feel. And then you can start to balance between them. Yeah, that um, and that's fascinating. And it also is it, what's interesting about that, too, is it kind of goes very much against the uh prevailing culture that we live in now where um you know with social media and smartphones and everything like this where it's very much ego narcissism very much self-focused and and not patience it's very much reactive i have to get in there quickly and then move on um short attention spans all of that and this kind of runs almost counter to that it's a very interesting you know dichotomy isn't it it really is. And it's something that we really need to embrace and integrate into our culture. You know, we have become so focused on the new, the young, the flash, the fast, etc. And that's just not sustainable uh, in a culture. It's important to understand history. It's important to understand, uh, you know, uh, how things actually operate. And what we really need to do in our organizations, we need to build, build a bridge between the young folks that are in that really master technology and can do amazing things with that. Certainly far exceeds my ability. I'm, I'm a boomer. I'm 66. So I'm somewhat technology challenged. But what I have to offer and what older, you know, the older people, I would say anybody kind of like in their 50s and above, they've got this pool of wisdom. It's really valuable that when you blend the power and the speed and the brilliance of the, the youth and their ability to, to leverage technology with the wisdom and experience of what I'll call the elders, uh, you get a very powerful combination that when you bring that together in an organization, really maximizes performance and maximize your ability to leverage the collective genius in your company. Right now, there's a separation, there's conflict between those two. But as co conscious leadership teaches ways to be able to break down those barriers and get us operating more as a, as a tribe that looks to determine what are people's strengths and weaknesses and how do we integrate them? Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And it's an, in it's an interesting challenge going forward is, is both groups like acknowledging that and the other, if you like, and being able to work together. Um, something, um, in, in, a concept you mentioned in your book is the power of the bigger no. Mm. Can you explain that one to me? Yeah, that's something that, you know, that was a concept that first hit me when I was watching a documentary many years ago, probably 17 years ago now. And in it, uh, the concept of this elder was being asked by this young person, you know, what are the differences between people? And uh, the old, it was an elder Rastafarian. And he said, mm -hmm. there's no differences between people. The only difference is what it is that we know. He said, for instance, you know what you know, I know what I know, and together we have a bigger no. And when I heard that, that just blew me away and actually put me on a journey that has led me to where I'm at. And the bigger no is the collective genius and energies within any group. 
And, you know, anytime you're leading a team, uh, you can't just look at them as what are their job descriptions and what are they hired to do? You really want to get a sense for what have they done in the past? What capabilities, what knowledge, what experience, uh, what level of creativity? Are they linear thinkers or creative thinkers? And you, as you begin to open your mind up to explore what those capabilities are, you start to realize how powerful that bigger no is. And it's so powerful that you begin to become desirous of learning how to tap into it, engage it more. Because if you activate your bigger no, you're getting more ideas and more energy coming into you and you have to manage and push less. And it mm -hmm. really engages the people because they want to be engaged. And uh, it's a very, very powerful concept. And that's basically what all of my work is about is A, it's there and then how to activate it and leverage it in real world conditions to get it working for you. Yeah, and and I guess um, for that to for that to work, you have to obviously have a have a kind of an abundant mindset yourself, if you like. You know, to say like, yeah, there's a finite amount of things that I know. There's things that other people know. There's there's a whole tribal knowledge within my organization, and it really gets us away from that idea uh that kind of competitive idea you know the internal competition like if if you come up with something smart oops is that taking away from me now because i see everything is finite or is this adding to it and i think that's part of the mind shift that needs to happen is we need to see everything as additive and expansive as opposed to well if you do something then somehow that's subtracting from me Right. You know, the industrial age model creates that competitiveness, that hierarchy and that survival by the fittest. And what I do, I've studied a lot of uh, indigenous cultures as well mm -hmm. for years. And uh, my process is pull people back into that tribal mindset because, you know, imagine a tribe. And the thing about tribes is they were so close to uh, dying because <laughs> nature yeah. could take them out. Right. So they needed all the talents of, of everyone. So imagine somebody in a tribe that had a great capability, but they were snuffed out because uh, of an egotistical leader. It wouldn't take long before that tribe to not exist. Yeah. And so this really takes a higher level of consciousness, which is that tribal elder consciousness and plugs it into a capitalistic environment. And it ends up giving you a higher level of consciousness and a, and a greater degree of success, both financially and with culturally within the workplace. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, most for, for, for tribes or communities like that to, to work, there has to be a level of respect and trust within that, that, mm. that grouping, which is the thing I think is the, is the hardest thing to establish in, in modern companies, right? Is that whole level of mutual respect and, and, and mutual trust. Well, that's where as leaders, we have to first define our, establish our level of consciousness. And then what I do, again, you know, I like acronyms, things that are easy mm -hmm. for me to remember. And uh, when I was looking at what some of the fundamental principles that will serve you, no matter what culture or industry that you're in as a leader. And uh, what I found is I, I talk about leading with AIR. And AIR is an acronym for authenticity, integrity, and respect. So authenticity is me being clear and, and having integrity with myself right? Uh, and being that in the world. Integrity has to do with me being of good character, doing what it is that I say I'm going to be doing and playing nice in the sandbox. Uh, and then respect is about me respecting my boundaries, respecting your boundaries, and both of us respecting who we're working for and the objective we're there to achieve. And if you can operate within that realm, you're really going to create a, a set of conditions that's going to get get the good people in the organization, which most of them are, to start mm -hmm. functioning at a higher level of consciousness. And they like that environment. So they begin to become stewards of it as well. It shifts out of the toxic and makes it more of a collaborative and uh, a, a, a humanistic place to work. Yeah, because I think that's the that's the that's the real fundamental piece there, isn't it? The fact when everybody feels a level of of ownership and uh, a, a belonging, and I guess that's what the the tribe like belonging to the tribe, contributing to the tribe. So, a sense of ownership of of contributing to the organization. So rather than just being an employee, but you're an important part of the the organism, if you will. Exactly, and it's you know it's kind of the different mindset between leasing a car and owning it, or renting a home and buying it. 
Uh, mm -hmm. You become vested in taking care of what you have a part of, of ownership in. And, you know, what's really fascinating is once people start to sense this cultural shift, they really start looking to participate in it and to, and, and to maintain it, to sustain it. And then what happens is management gets easier because as the leader, I don't have to go around making sure everyone's behaving. What's happening is the tribe is managing itself. And once the tribe gets healthy, uh, they then look and see people that are bad actors that are not working uh, in a collaborative mm -hmm. way or whatever. Uh, and then they go in and they start looking to get them to adjust. And because we are tribal by nature, we know, you know, 20,000 years ago, if you were thrown out of the tribe, you died. And, mm -hmm. and that's kind of in our DNA that we don't want to be rejected. So that's where you create an environment of positive peer pressure that comes in to works to maintain that level of respect within the culture and people that can't fit into that, they either become assimilated in it or they find another place to work. So it becomes mm -hmm. a really powerful dynamic. And I guess a part of that too then is that it creates this uh, resiliency, right? This, this strength or power that you can go through um, challenges. You know, let's face it. I mean, we've been through obviously serious challenges over the last couple of years and resiliency has really come to come to the forefront, like the ability to be able to, and the ability to be able to operate with a lot of unknowns. And I think that's probably the biggest change that we've seen is there was always unknowns now we've been through this period of so many unknowns that it's become something that we have to kind of live with so that resi that resiliency knowing that you can overcome and that you can operate without all of the facts um immediately available to you i think that that's quite a powerful thing if you can get it right it's probably the most powerful force in any organization uh you know, because resiliency is not about just, you know, getting hit and, and getting back up. It's about getting back up and being stronger. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Peter Drucker once wrote that culture eats strategy for breakfast. And what he's talking about in that is if you build a really strong culture where people are connected to one another, have a sense of loyalty to one another and, and what it is that they're doing, they can withstand tremendous amount of pressures to a tremendous amount of uncertainty and complexity, but they're all in it together and they're, and they're working their way through. It's the same, uh, it's the same part of us that comes together when there's a natural disaster in our community. Mm -hmm. you know, people just rally and come together and all of a sudden, you know, there, there are no CEOs and there are no uh, janitors. Mm -hmm. It's just human to human. And that's what we have to take advantage of and reactivate in our organizations. We treat organizations like, uh, like they're assembly lines. We have a mechanized view and approach to uh, a living organism. And that's why there are uh, only... 30% of people are engaged in work. So 70% of the, the employees are not engaged in work. Gallup studies this for years and years. But at the same time, Gallup has found that 70% of the people want to be engaged. So to me, it's clear it's not a people issue. It's a model issue. And that's what I've spent the last 10 years on is researching what are those new models? What's the problems with the, the old one? Keep what's good. Get rid of what doesn't. And then what do you replace that with? Because you can't just go in and tell somebody mm. to stop doing something without giving them an alternative that works. So that's what all of my work is, uh, is about, is giving people the new mindsets, the new models, and the new methods they can use to help begin to transform their organization. It doesn't happen overnight, but you can, you can feel the results pretty quickly. Yeah. And and just the last comment on, on, on this is that, uh, as you mentioned at the very, very beginning, is that communication becomes extremely critical. Uh, and not just because you're going through a transformation, but also, let's face it, uh, organization structures going through so many transformations, even in physical, like where you have hybrid work, where you have virtual work, where you, all of these things. And and as you said, you have so many different generations in the workforce that the the communication part of it is absolutely critical. It is. And, you know, there's something that uh, it used to be that leadership training was enough, but it's not anymore. You need next level uh, leadership training, but you also need to go in with new organizational development and designs because, mm -hmm. you know, you get a leader that's highly advanced training and then he comes into an antiquated organization. It's going to choke it out. Yeah. So if you want to move your organization forward. Leadership is the, the right uh 
leg that's taken a step, organizational development is the left. And you have to bring those two together. Otherwise, you're going to have a problem. But if you do that and you come at it with a different level of consciousness, you'll be amazed at how things turn around. And, you know, I work in clients all the time and I prove this stuff out. That's why I spend so much time trying to teach it and preach it. <laughs> because if you can get yeah. it, it makes your life a lot easier. It's tricky, but it, it works. Yeah, fantastic. Well, listen, um, Jeffrey, this has been great. All of Jeffrey's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and your work. Yeah, I focus on small to medium sized uh, business owners and uh, executives who are looking to build their organization to the next level. They're faced with human capital issues. They're faced with financial capital. And uh, I've found that if you get the human capital part right, the financial capital shows up. So all of my stuff is cutting edge, next generation stuff, but it's designed to work in the trenches. So uh, no platitudes. All Everything I talk about is stuff that I've either got my brains beat in mm -hmm. on and figured out. <laughs> All right. Well, fantastic. And I really would encourage people to check it out. I mean, things are changing so rapidly right now. And I think this is a fantastic opportunity for people to to really experiment with a completely different way or, or a very highly evolved way to to approach work. So thanks again, Jeffrey. Thank you for watching and listening. And I'll see you all again soon. Thank you.